Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Virtues of Peace on this 67th anniversary of the armistice of the Korean War. I am joined by Taylor Ackerman. Hello. Michael Buzzy. Hello, everyone. And Randy Olson. Hello again. And my name is Hope Elizabeth May, and... This is our seventh show in a series focused on the Korean War. And as today is Armistice Day, we have titled this show Exiting the Forest of the Korean War, Philosophical Reflections on the Korean War on the 67th Anniversary of its Armistice. We have talked uh, about many things during this series, and we thought that we would just do some stock-taking and do maybe a deeper dive into some of the issues that have come up. And that is what we're doing today. It's sort of a potpourri of topics, but mainly um, philosophical, um, focusing on some of the epistemological and psychological dimensions of the series and the themes that we've talked about, uh, as well as this different approach to history that really is the focus of the Virtues of Peace podcast, which I call Positive History, um, which is <clears throat> approaching the past through a different narrative and through stories of cooperation and uplift. So to begin, I'm just going to, to play a very short clip, and then, Taylor, we're going to turn it over to you. Uh, but this clip is from Lama Bowie, who came up last time because she was and still is part of Women's Cross DMZ. She crossed the DMZ in 2015 with um, an international delegation of 30 women, organized by Christine Ahn, who was our special guest last week. And um, this very short clip is um, Lama explaining why she is partaking in this historic walk in 2015. So here's the clip, and then I'm going to um, turn it over to Taylor. The essence of this journey for me is to bring back the human dimension in this conflict where hearts have been broken, homes have been torn apart, families have been destroyed, and all we see on TV and in the international media is the militarized portion of this war. Right, so bringing back the human dimension. And looking at this war, it's, it's, it, it seems difficult to not look at a war through a military dimension or military lens, but that is what Lema is exhorting us to do. And um, I think, Taylor, you wanted to talk more about that paradigm shift? Yeah, I I think, you know, at one point we, we spoke um, earlier in the series um, briefly about um, the importance of looking at the individual stories and, and the mm-hmm. viewing this, like this war and the context of how it impacted like each human. Um, mm-hmm. When we, when we do that, I think it's so important because, you know, it's not just a number um you know, of casualties or deaths, like we see the impact. But when we do that too, I think it's, it can be very discouraging and it can um, cause us to lose sight of humanity and sort of um, the goal of the peace movement and the reality of, of war, which is that there's also human goodness and there's um, heroism. And by like bringing to light the, these stories of individual sort of heroism and, individual like these moments of humanity were able to actually sort of transcend past the human sort of um uh inclination to view uh people like the op people on the um i guess you could call it opposing side of a conflict as you know pure evil like each person is a human mm-hmm. and it also removes sort of the 
blanket um, that people can kind of hide behind, um, like assuming that there's nothing they can do about it. Um, because if we're constantly told about all these tor- horrible stories about war, which it's important for us to recognize um, th- this history, and, and we, we have um, during this conversation, but we've also recognized stories um, like Christine on going to North Korea and her, her daughter getting sick. And it's just a very simple story and how, you know, the North Koreans there like helped her. And it's a very humanizing story. When we do that, we can also see like the human connection. And I think that's the only way for um, sort of the peace movement to succeed. And we can see that with like Lema Bowie, how much mm-hmm. that inspired um, Christine on as well. Um, mm-hmm. And so if we take away that kind of like that excuse that it's like only terrible things um, and we're able to see that other people have done these heroic acts. And I think each individual can also um, look at themselves as someone who is capable of also doing heroic acts and doing the right thing. Yeah. So this different um, perspective on this conflict um, enlarges the, I, I, John Stuart Mill, I think, talks about the marketplace of ideas. Um, But in some of my work, I've referred to a marketplace of identities. And so we have these moral exemplars of, of people doing these heroic things. We have some examples that we may get to, but you've mentioned um, Lema Bowie, um, this, the humanizing of the North Koreans who helped Christine with her daughter Um, I have some other examples in mind, but I want to open it up to anybody else who wants to comment on Taylor's comment. Sure. Um, The main one that comes to my mind is, you know, a name that we've talked about many times, Bertha von Sutner, and, Mm -hmm. you know, one of her her major works is Lay Down Your Arms, Die Waffen Nieder, and and the whole premise of the book is that, hey, when we're talking about military conflict, there's a dimension at mm-hmm. home that we need to at least acknowledge. And mm-hmm. that new frame was so revolutionary of an idea that, you know, not only did it become this best-selling work and make enormous social change, like set in motion all these things, not not notwithstanding just, hey, peace conferences – but who knows how many other things it's Mm. like just having somebody bring the frame forward has Mm. an enormous consequence. And so if we, you know, if we emphasize the fact that there are more than one way to look at a conflict, there's more than one way to look at a situation and emphasizing the role of individuals in conflicts often brings the human component with it uh, naturally. Right. So, mm-hmm. you know, a totally different example, but like the women in the American Civil War who were going out and operating as field medics because they needed to they needed to contribute somehow. Right. Mm-hmm. That builds itself into the Red Cross. And that's a story that we don't have access to with a with like normal cultural narratives. Mm-hmm. And once that narrative is there, it's like, oh, wait women were involved in such a ridiculously important way in American history. Cool. Tell me more. And (laughs) like, that's the goal for me of looking because once that new frame shows up, no matter where you look, the new frame opens more doors. And so I think Mm -hmm. that's kind of what we're, what we're pushing toward. Yeah. And just on the birth of Unsutner example, indeed. So she just, like, it's like this perspective had, had, was annihilated from any discourse or understanding that the perspective of how war affects families is just totally annihilated from the discourse and also the peace movement in a way, because Bertha did not come to the peace movement when she was in, in midlife in her like around 45, I think, and pretty much by accident and she has to do something just like that frame. It's another frame, the peace movement, that we can solve our disputes nonviolently. We have to organize the world to do so. And that totally impacts her such that she writes Die Waffen Nieder. And as you say, it has all of these effects, notwithstanding the Hague Peace Conferences and all these other ones we don't know about, um, 
but one that she talks about, I think it's in her memoirs, she talks about how when she's at the 1899 Hague Peace Conference and she's doing her salon um, and she's meeting all of these diplomats and officials and so forth, I think it's like an official from Sweden brings his son and his son has read Die Waffen Nieder and she, he says to her, like, before I read your book, I was just, like, going to go in, in the military and, and do that. And now I want to be a judge and work for the peace through law movement. Um, so there it is. Like, so the frame, that, and that goes to the marketplace of identities point as well. So both this ideas and opening up our minds to a different way of looking at things, and then, of course, impacting the person's moral development is one of the powerful consequences of these these different narratives and when you focus on the individual um it's so, like it just makes it meaningful in a way that um you know keeping the the story at the level of events does not and i'm reminded of um vera britton uh, wrote a book it was then made into a movie the book is much better called testament of youth and this part is not in the movie, but in this book, she's, she has um, a phrase that says, I wasn't really interested in world affairs until I saw how um, worldwide events can impact the personal destinies of men and women. And so when we're bringing the individual into the story, because <clears throat> there's, there's two things ta- I think that Taylor is contributing. One is like we bring the individual in number one, and number two, we bring in these positive stories, and both are really, really important for shifting the narrative. Um, But start to see how this huge event, and like maybe for many people, the Korean War is just so abstract. And so you really got to make it meaningful by connecting it to like an individual, um, an individual who suffers through that or is working now on ending it and so forth. Uh, anybody else on this point that we're on? I would say uh, uh, first struck by. Oh, thank you. How, like, even we were talking about Bertha von Studner's ideas of well over a century ago, and how this idea of frame of looking at war through a dimension of a really personal human aspect is still quite new to a lot of people, and I think. Mm-hmm. Christine An's experience in South Korea really spoke to this when after they had crossed the DMZ from the north into the south, there was counter protesters there to denounce <laughs> her actions and the group of women across the DMZ as collaborating with the quote unquote like, oppressors in North Korea and these evil individuals, whereas her work was trying to transcend that dimension and connect directly with the people of North Korea. So I, I definitely agree there's still a lot of work to be done in bringing this sort of looking at war through a human dimension to a wider group of individuals that they can really then come to understand this dimension of Bertha von Suttner's idea. Yeah, and I'm going to speak more about that um, when I get to my comments at at the end. Um, But this this point of, like, there's there's this sort of, uh, like, knee-jerk reaction. If you're friendly towards quote unquote the enemy there's something wrong with you and you are you are unpatriotic or you are you are a communist or 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 you don't care about human rights and in her case that was the critique that insofar as you're working with this regime you obviously don't care about human rights and so uh, we'll say more about that later um Final thoughts on this, like, positive narrative. I think, Brandy, did you want to say something else? Uh, Well, you know, it's not directly relevant to that, but an anecdote came to my mind about the the, the abstractness of the Korean War, right, in Mm -hmm. in that frame, um, Mm -hmm. and how, for one reason or another, it's an idea that's, it's, it's something that we have to reconstruct for some reason. And I know it's built into the, like, we know that because we call it the forgotten war. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, I know that for me, what happened very strangely was that, you know, I was like, I was six or seven years old and I was sitting in uh, the pool with my uncle who was a, you know, he was a veteran of the Korean war. And I could remember arguing with him 
as a seven-year-old that didn't he mean Vietnam? <laughs> and it's just, it's just like somehow all the way down into not only my memory, but then my consciousness as a child, the, the pressure was there to push the Korean War out of the frame because it didn't match this other idea that like the, the only war that occurred since World War II was Vietnam. And mm. for whatever reason, that pressure, which is making it down to the level of the individual, has these tendrils up in these other places that we have to weave together in order to have the coherent narrative again. And what, you know, and so, I mean, I know we're going to go into this more in a minute, but this idea of like psychological warfare and propaganda, which we talked about for a while, mm-hmm. it, it has this, this dimension where we're so, we're so used to thinking about that externally, about how we use that against the enemy to make X, Y, Z things happen. And we forget that, we are people too, and we are being dehumanized in our own homes by the same technologies. And so that's a, like, that's a thing that I eventually want to say more about, but I could take that in 400 directions, so I think I'll, All right, well, I'll we'll put the leash on. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that when we talk more about psychological warfare or uh, psychological operations, how it's, it's now called. Um, but uh michael so you also thought that this fo- focusing on this like people pe- people to people aspect um was important and you had some other thoughts as well can you can you share for sure throughout these past seven shows i definitely have come to feel that a direct people like coming to realize an individual's humanity and a people to people connection serves as the catalyst for like universal peace that that is the secret ingredient as we had referred to like concoctions and stuff in the previous episode that mm-hmm. through establishing that connection you can sort of look past as a political science society or like as an individual who is studying it these ideas of patriotism and nationalism are highly focused upon but they sort of serve as lenses that distort individuals' perceptions. The work of individuals like Charles Hamlin and Christine Ahn in the context of, I guess, a U.S. side to the Korean War would be seen as unpatriotic. Charles Hamlin's book, Ghost Flames, which comes out next month, tells the story of many individuals across all sides of the Korean War, and most do not paint the United States in quite a sort of victorious and all-virtuous light. And Christine Ahn's work of you know, going to Pyongyang and discussing the war with the North Koreans would be con- is considered treasonous in some individuals' minds. But I think, especially in Christine Don's case of going to Pyongyang and interacting with these individuals, I remember watching her ABLE lecture series from April of 2016 when she came to Central Michigan and spoke about her experience, and they played a clip from her time there. And they were at the International Women's Peace Symposium at the Cultural People's House in Pyongyang. And there was a woman who was in her late 70s who spoke of her experience in the Korean War. And she was seven years old at the time, and she lost both of her hands due to the fighting. And just her sheer, I guess, visceral emotional reaction to that event. And at the end of her comment, she pleads that if there's ever another war on the Korean Peninsula, it'll be the women and the children who suffer the most. And that, like witnessing that for me, just completely cut across all sort of ideological lines and it hits on that very human note and then it truly like allows you to step back and as Charles Hanley puts it so aptly in a couple episodes ago like that Jesus Christ this is my country moment that how sort of futile and absolutely meretricious these ideas of like war and like conquest are when you have such a profound impact that happens on the individual level and just such deep pain and scarring for meretricious goals and truly through Christine Ahn's like, work going there and being able to bring out that humanness of the North Korean people, especially for an individual like me was like, we can easily cross whatever ideological barriers. And mm-hmm. Christine Ahn also in her able lecture series, she said the way that we are not, the way that we will be able to bring an end to this war and 
bring an end to the fighting and the conflict and the hurt that has persisted for so many decades is by interacting with North Koreans, we will change their hearts. And that will be the catalyst that will allow us to come to realize how just absolutely futile all of this truly has been and hopefully bring about peace. And also when I was reflecting on this, a quote from the Baha'i Faith founder, a 19th century Persian religious scholar, scholar came to mind. And he said the following, it is not for him to pride himself who loveth his own country, but rather for him who loveth the whole world. The earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. And I felt like mm-hmm. that just so aptly put what I have been able to bring out of, for me personally, these past seven episodes. Mm, that's very beautifully put. Um, anybody comment on that? A comment on that? Yeah, I uh, I want to pick up this idea of um, we used the phrase a few episodes ago about true patriotism, and you know, mm. uh, I know you talked about patriotism quite a, quite a bit there, and like what that means, and uh, there's a there's a quote that I really appreciate um, from Maywright Sewell that illustrates a little bit closer. Uh, to like maybe the ideal of what patriotism ought to be aiming at. And it involves this kind of self evaluate self-evaluation and like the really looking at the sources through which people develop, the, call it unhealthy form of patriotism. That's just turning a blind eye to some of the black spots on our own, you know, on our own, history and so I'll, I'll read the quote uh it's it's a little long so fasten uh, your seatbelt believing in yeah <laughs> uh, believing in evolution as the only process and education as the only method by which nations can be brought into such relations to one another as are compatible with the golden rule the international council of women has asked each one of the affiliated national councils to instruct its committee on peace and arbitration to make a rigid examination of all textbooks on the history of their own country, which are being studied in its schools. This is to be done with a view to ascertaining to what degree the relative importance of war in the development of a country and the relative glory of military achievement are exaggerated in such textbooks. It is believed by the Peace and Arbitration Committee of the International Council that to a degree which would be appalling were it realized by the modern world, modern history as taught in most countries results in the development of an arrogant and vain glorious regard for one's own country and in contempt, resentment, and hatred towards other nations. It is impossible that any but a false patriotism shall be the fruit of such shall be the fruit of such study, of such textbooks, and of such instruction. It is impossible that children whose minds have been fed on distortion shall, as men and women, see historical events in their just proportion. So, okay, that's that's the end of the quote. And it's amazing to me because that was written 120 years ago, more than 120 years ago. And it's still, so it's, it's gotten worse, not better, despite our, you know, it's like the people who certainly see it for what it is and are doing their best to make that situation not occur as often. They're just overpowered by these other forces and we could name them, but it's like we need to know what has happened, how we got to where we are. We have to build these bridges to our history and to our past and to connect ourselves back in to the structures upon which we live. Mm -hmm. And the basic, I mean, just to say it super easily, like if you have a crack in the foundation of your house and you don't repair it, eventually water is going to destroy the whole structure. Just by nature of how water works, And foundations of structures work. And so, you know, we're we're living in a time now where people debate 
back and forth about what things are true and what things aren't true and what things are facts and how do we actually determine this. And we're moving into a land where epistemology is becoming a, a relevant field of study again because people somehow stop believing opinions of other people and refuse to accept other accounts than their own. And so we have to start evaluating how we got to where we are. And when there's a big hole in the story, we need to ask ourselves, well, what actually happened during that period, right? From the end of the 40s until the beginning of the 60s, there was something going on in the world. And for whatever reason, people's historical narrative ends at World War II and begins again in the 1960s, at least the, the narrative of people in the United States, right? I, I don't have a good sample otherwise. Hmm. So, Cool. Um, and I would say even before May Wright Sewell writes that, that quote about true patriotism, I mean, you have this idea, like well, well before – that um, Charles Sumner's speech, The True Grandeur of Nations, talks about a, like a false nationalism. And uh, uh, we've said on this show, the word cosmopolitan comes from the Stoic philosophy. Um, so third, fourth century-ish. <laughs> this is um, a long time ago. Um, so indeed, there are a lot of... Uh, or at least let's just focus on one, uh, as you are, um, worms, as Virginia Woolf would say, that need to be uh, removed from the organism. Uh, and this being uh, an, an erroneous sense of patriotism, which r stems from an incomplete and one-sided narrative of history. Uh, cool. Um, I, I want to pick up on this because we're now getting to, um, my turn, I think. <laughs> and, and you mentioned like epistemolo epistemology is now, you know, becoming relevant again because people don't believe in truth anymore. And what I, what I want to say that one, one of the sort of deep lessons that I, I've been reflecting on from our series on the Korean war uh, and I think I, I made it last time in um, our discussion with Christine on is about this ideological division um, that Korea is the focal point of an ideological division and that division affects hearts, minds, characters, bodies. Um, and this for lack of a better word, I'm going to say this is like truth is polarized. I think truth is very complex. I think moral truth is very complex. Um, and I believe on this show we have quoted Jane Addams uh, numerous times that the world progresses in the slow and halting manner in which it does progress uh, in proportion to the moral energy of the men and women living in it. So basically, like, you must drill down to the individual. If you want to talk about progress, you have to talk about the moral energy of the individual. That's where it lives. Um, and so the thing is, when you have a, um, an, an individual with moral energy, that individual is complex and has his or her own worms to deal with. And I just want to share a story that <clears throat> it, the factualism on the Korean peninsula is not just a result, like it was there before the Korean War, but people who have written on Korean history um, have noted that the, like, there is this like particular peculiar thing with factionalism and like you're either with us or against us. You're either in and you're out. And some have said that that can be traced back to the, like the kinship dimension and family and familial um, relationships are more important than quote unquote relationships to institutions. Um, in any case, during the, I just want to share that this story that I'm about to share, um, I did share it in The Hague last year, and it's about to be, it'll be like in an article that's coming out. But um, this is a story that I had to really like 
do a lot of digging to uncover and I had I like I couldn't do it without someone who who knew Korean and who knew how to read Chinese okay but um but basically <clears throat> during the 1919 um uprising nonviolent uprising there was a quote unquote collaborator okay so today on the Korean peninsula like if you so first of all either like as Christine said you you some people are just painted communist even if they just are quote unquote the slightest bit left whatever that means um but this happened during the reign of Sigmund Rhee and if you um expressed any sort of quote leftist tendencies you were a communist and you were put into prison um uh, or or killed right so the Jeju massacre is all about this inability to see a middle ground this inability to approach moderation and the complexity of of truth and political truth and human truth so this is like rampant and it's becoming rampant in this in the United States but it's 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 somewhat rampant on the Korean peninsula because they have this thing called a black list and if you have collaborated with the Japanese who were the colonial masters right prior to liberation you're like any like if you have any connection whatsoever regardless of what you've done for Korea like even if you founded universities and did all these things any like scintilla, like any connection whatsoever to like any help and assistance that you've given to the Japanese you are you go on this blacklist um and you are quote unquote a collaborator and i just want to share this story that i uncovered which like helps us to see the complexity of this and how it really does require thinking and self-searching that you're talking about where like we really have to search ourselves this is what true patriotism is um and this is a story they're printing the declaration of independence they know that once this thing gets out they're going to die like this is just a death sentence to declare independence on a document sign your name make 20,000 copies and distribute them throughout the peninsula this is before the division of the country okay this is very important because the way that the story is told in the south totally ignores what happens in pyongyang during this but um <clears throat> but in any case like secretly if they printed 20,000 copies okay this is 100 years ago this is 1919 and a korean working for the japanese police walks in and quote unquote catches the catches them red-handed catches the freedom fighters i hate to use that word but the patriots the independence fighters catches that they're they're printing this this document and i think something happens because this policeman obviously didn't say anything the movement happened the document got out we have it today it is a thing of beauty it is like the polar opposite of the treaty of versailles it it paints a, a new a new way forward one that issues or passes over or rejects revenge retaliation and humiliation of the other when they wronged us this is like expressed in the founding document of 1919 and i think what happens is the policeman is in like the, the printing house and and they say look you're korean and like this is like this is your chance to do something um <clears throat> and so he doesn't he doesn't reveal he doesn't go to his superiors he he keeps it to himself they give him money he flees and he's then killed in what is now North Korea now i'm telling you this how does this relate to the korean war he may be asking i'm telling you this because today um like this guy is portrayed as a bad guy okay because he's a collaborator and and uh, he he took a bribe and he's no moral hero he took a bribe right but he did he didn't tell like the thing happened so some like something happened and this is moral complexity and we like like he was like maybe looking for a chance to redeem himself and so i think every person what they're doing okay has like a complex story like this uh whether they're north korean south korean etc and you really have to do a lot of work to get down to these individual stories but when you do um it causes you to reflect upon yourself um and you know you just the the the, the false narrative that has been operating starts to melt away the thing is it takes a lot of work 
to, to get to these stories of individuals. I mean, going back to Charles Hanley's book, so like that book, um, which, as Michael said, is coming out next month, <laughs> I think it's August 18th, um, that arose out of his earlier book on No Gun Re. So it's like, like working on that story, the No Gun Re story, which was trying to be buried, like unearthed all of these other stories and all of these other individuals that came to Charles Hanley's attention, right? And now we have this book that's coming out. Um, and so, like, that's a lot of work, right, to get to those stories. That's my point. And that's what, you know, thinking, I was trying to make this point last time that, like that's the hard work and it's so it's so easy and requires no thought whatsoever to say you're a collaborator or you're just a communist, right? Um I think a lot of people don't even understand yeah. what those words mean half the time, quite frankly. So I'll stop. I've been talking way yeah. too long. Yeah. I <laughs> well I I well go ahead, Taylor. Oh, I was just gonna say when you um when you're speaking about sort of this moral complexity of the individual, I was thinking of Charles Hanley's description of the um, U.S. veterans who came forward and actually responded to him about what mm. happened at No Gun Re mm. and the guilt that they mm. felt for years. Um, and when I initially, you know, learned about No Gun Re, I thought, you know, monsters, right? It's, it's so easy to just assume that one person is a monster and like that is the end all, be all. And I, I think it's, interesting because just like we have to look at like the complexity of um of you know uh we have to look at the complexity of each individual um as time passes like we have to offer sort of that opportunity for um restorative healing and restorative justice uh for both Mm -hmm. the victim and the the perpetrator and i think that's very difficult Mm -hmm. yeah and um Topic for a future show: <laughs> this moral complexity and um, and the the fact that people come to consciousness and and change and get sober and right. Um, so it takes time for people and and I think <clears throat> going back to the case of the collaborators during Japan, I know because I've read basically like many autobiographies of these people in English. And I've been told by my Korean friends, of course they're saying that because they have to make themselves look good. Like this, this is like (laughs) these, these accounts are dismissed as these people are just, it's like PR for themselves. And of course they're, they're saying these things, but um, one person in particular, like a lot of these people are Christian and are trying to practice the Christian teaching of forgiveness and compassion and so this is behind their quote unquote collaborating actions, right? Um, so I'll just yeah, it's complex, <laughs> and and I think that um, this this can be we can talk about this more in another show. And I, I know that Emmanuel Kant has very interesting things to say about about um, shifts shifts in the self and and coming to like listen to the law within and act according to it. Go ahead, Randy. Well, so there's a number of issues that are all packaged into, you know, trying to like perhaps understand why phenomena like this takes place. And as far as I can tell, there's this, I think it's a will to ignorance that Mm. motivates a tremendous number of things. And one of the, one of the ways that that emerges is through a fake critical thinking it's mm-hmm. it's called critical thinking but it's really just like like a a, a systematic straw manning of the other mm-hmm. and so you know when i was in the university it became very obvious to me like while i was studying philosophy that the way to do good on your papers was to attack the person who you were reading and you, you know, I was trained in some sense to just rip somebody apart based on one tiny sentence that didn't perfectly match up with an ideology. And then I would paint the ideology, show how it didn't line up. I was the moral victor in the situation. And that wasn't just in philosophy, but the point is, it's extraordinarily easy 
to attack someone, especially when you misrepresent them. And so why take somebody's character into account and have to think about them as a complex individual human being with their own moral defects and their own virtues and try to package all of that into something real when you could just say that they disagree with you on one ideological point, therefore they're a demon, and you can ignore all of the things that they've ever done that are good. It's a lot easier to do that. And I think that mm-hmm. biochemically we could probably map out a motive for that kind of thinking because it's less expensive. Mm-hmm. But it's important to, to, to paint that image over in uh, the widest scope that we can because there's like a spiritual underpinning to that where, you know, people live in boxes and they like their boxes to be orderly. And we could talk about the psychological dimension to that and like how psychoanalytics can map these things out. But certain people like their boxes to be intact more than others. And so, you know, this person believing something different than you challenges you in a way that you don't have the, the time, energy, or will to deal with. Therefore, find the cheapest way to attack them that you can, put them in a box that is other, and you no longer have to deal with the disagreement. Mm-hmm. Now, that as a mechanism is happening more than I've ever experienced it. And perhaps it's because, you know, I'm just older now and can pay attention more, but we're seeing the same procedure of you've done one thing that disagrees with our, you know, our ideological paradigm. Therefore you're a monster. Like we're seeing that in the United States in a ridiculous number of events. And the difference as far as I can tell is that it's, it's shifted right now. And I, I don't know how to map the ebb and flow of political views. So I, you know, I don't have a wide enough scope, but I know that right now, If you don't agree with certain people on the left, you're immediately a Nazi. And that's the same kind of thinking, but it's on the other, it's from the other direction, right? So Mm -hmm. it's like, if you, if you tilt even, even one degree past center towards the left, you're now a communist. If you tilt even one degree towards the right, you're now a Nazi. Mm -hmm. And it's like, look, that is low resolution thinking. And if you want to get anywhere with low resolution thinking, know that the only direction you're going to get is demolition. The only thing you can do with a hammer that big is break things. So I don't know. I, I, I want to move into a conversation about epistemology, but I want to pause there before I do and see anything. Hey, anybody else have any, investigate uh, I, there. I, I, uh, I will hold my breath for the shift to epistemology. Anybody want to say anything about these remarks? Just or what a disservice generalizations do to the individual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh well, okay. So I'll keep I'll keep going then. Um mm-hmm. so I'm going to I'm going to start with a an axiom, all right? And so we can disagree if, you know, if anyone listening wants to disagree, disagree with this axiom. Uh, The axiom is an assumption about a definition of truth. And I'm going to operate from the pragmatist lens, uh, most, I guess, famously and like most eloquently proposed by William James, where truth is an event, it's some it's a it's a moment where a subjective like a a unit of observation is taking information about the environment mapping it onto their experience determining a certain degree of utility and then evaluating that at, and evaluating the utility as truth we're using truth as something that can be measured within that frame but only by the subject because they know their own frame. So that, that's, that's going to be the, the, the unit that I'm operating from when I'm referring to truth. Now, of course, there are ways to disagree with that. There are a thousand other definitions 
And yeah, so people will say that that's a lazy, incur- that you're lazy for adopting it. But anyway, <laughs> I've, I've right, heard that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so it's so easy to attack a conversation like this, but we have to start somewhere. And so I'm mm-hmm. going to start from there, right? I, the pragmatist lens seems to have some shade of utility for me <laughs> because it, it gets it gets the concept of truth all the way down into the realm of action, and we can start to use it. So during the Korean War, there was an, uh, a strong need to remain truthful when developing propaganda in order to establish credibility for future propaganda and future military activity. So, you know, in the, on the show resources page, there is a clip um, from the Department of Defense, and it's this, it's, it's about 15, 16 minutes where it's a pitch or it seems like it's like a pitch about how propaganda is a weapon of war. And it talks in a, in a way that's actually so extraordinary that everybody would value it. It'll, it'll at least be entertaining for anyone listening. It's worth checking out. True. But there are, things in, there are things in this clip that are just amazing. And when we, when we map it on to this definition of truth, we can see – it, it becomes coherent. So, I mean, selected in the, in a semi-arbitrary way, some quotes from that. It's like the Department of Defense is, you know, has this thing where, quote, words are weapons, and quote, there's there's deliberate training in the nature, methods, and techniques of propaganda, and quote, more than 32 radio stations that present facts or propaganda in perhaps the most rewarding form of news. And then, quote, (laughs) news is a ready-made propaganda, and when denied access to outside information, is as welcome as food and water, unquote. Like, these are things that are being just outright celebrated by an entity that's explicitly trying to, you know, engage in military activities and construct a narrative for specific objectives, right? And so when we think about truth as this lens through which we look at the world through, we do end up choosing what things are important and what things are not. And the only way that occurs is through individuals. And that part is so extremely important because, again, through this frame of truth as an event through which a subject maps valence from the environment onto their map, it's like now we have individuals deciding what things are true and what things aren't true because they're responsible for a wide amount of dissemination of information, right? So in the Korean War, there were 32 radio stations, or perhaps more as, as went on. In the, in the film I'm referring to, it uses the number 32, 32 radio stations presenting information as news to the Korean Peninsula. And it wasn't all news in the same way that when we watch the news today, it's not all information. We're getting slices of facts that are selected for specific reasons by specific individuals. And we don't know who those people are, and perhaps if we looked, we might be able to locate who they are. But it's so important, especially today, to at least consider that when we think about things as news, we have to recognize that that is a form of truth that has been selected by people. And there might be other sides to the story. There might be other forms of information that need to be taken into account. And just because it disagrees with, a, with the, the frame that you want or just because a set of news validates a frame that you currently inhabit or occupy, it's like there might be more to it. And again, if we, if we step back, it's like, okay, truth is this thing that is a – it's like a, it's like a photograph of a moment – and whether or not something is true is based on the time and the place and the conditions 
of the subjective entity evaluating that moment, we do have to ask ourselves when things were no longer, like things that we currently believe are no longer true, that perhaps were true. And so maybe during the 60s, there was a reason to not focus on the Korean War so much. Maybe that was a true way of being a like historian or a patriot or whatever. I, I don't have a, a reason ready made, but we live in 2020. We need to know what happened in our lives as Americans. We need to know how our country progressed to the place where it is now. We need to know why Korea is in the news still. We need to know why Korea having nuclear weapons is more of a problem, more of an interest to our news agencies than India having nuclear weapons. Why? Well, there's a specific reason. There's a specific motive by specific people who selected it for specific reasons. And all of that is totally relevant. So I'm getting, you know, unhinged. I'm going to... (laughs) I'm going to... I'll pause for there for, at that point. And, and I'll just throw in a uh, a, a recommendation uh, of a film that is pretty old, um, that is made in the 70s maybe, um, and it's called Network. And um, has have any of you seen that film? Oh yeah, yeah. open the windows at night, everybody's screaming. I know all yeah. about that. Oh okay. Um, well, in any case, this is like a um, comment. I think Padachayevsky wrote the screenplay on the the fact that news is, quote, infotainment, um, and the film takes it to its logical conclusion. Um, in any case, uh, yes, so truth is political. Is that is that one way of summing up it's it's a tool it's a tool it can be many other things too but people wield it as a weapon and mm. and we can't forget that if the department of defense was celebrating the fact that news was a form of propaganda that could be used against the koreans in the 1950s it we didn't forget that news and words are weapons 70 years later like Mm. it's still that's still true that's still the case and Mm. if it was a weapon then it's extraordinarily advanced now Mm. and um, to connect with uh, current events on the Korean Peninsula that have to do with news and information um, we've mentioned it very briefly on this show when we talked about Um, psychological warfare and propaganda but um, the North Korean defector groups today in South Korea um, and were for many years sending over quote news and and other pieces of information um, sometimes food uh, rice, choco pies money um, but amongst the things that they were sending were news, and because of the 2018 Panmujam Declaration, which is on our show resources page, which I think we should all read okay, and study, um, because the Korean War has not ended, and this is an attempt um, to move towards that, and various promises are made and one of them is to stop the these uh, leaflets and also the sound, um, the use of loudspeakers. And so North Korea complained that, um, look, you're you're violating not only the armistice agreement um, but also the Panmujam Declaration. And so the Moon administration. Um, Start, like has now made it a crime in the South to do this because they're loyal. Like they really want to, you know, end the Korean War, and they think that they can do that with just this this common bond that 
the South has with the North. And um, the critique of that is that you're violating human rights because there's a right to information and the exchange of ideas and North Koreans are, are denied information. So I just wanted to like add, <laughs> add this other dimension to, to what we're saying. And um, my, my reaction to that is, you know, um, I, I can understand why the North is not happy with these leaflets. And in fact, one of them included uh, and I, I I learned this from the the Psy Warrior website that we've referred to. Um, but one of the leaflets has like his sister, like in scantily clad clothing. Okay, so I don't know if that counts as quote information about the world. <laughs> but um, given you know that there's this history of these that this is connected to the Korean War that. The, the the UN is connected to the Korean War, that United States troops went into the North under the imprimatur of the United Nations. You can understand, at least I can, why, why there's a sort of like reticence to cooperate. And you want to add on to that, like the thousands of years, okay? Um, and not just maybe thousands is too long, but that the years under Japanese colonialism, even before the Japanese, okay, there was China and Korea for thousands of years has been trying to, you know, maintain its independence and sovereignty. And these outside actors are always interfering. And North Korea is very, you know, nationalistic and, quote, patriotic in that way, that they're really trying to... Um, you know, resist the outside, the outside aggression. And so I just, so, so this still goes on. Okay. And I think that um, like a, an interesting case study, an interesting thing to, to think about, um, read the Panmunjom declaration. It's on our show resources page of April 27th, 2018, and read some of the articles about how the UN and other human rights groups have really criticized the moon administration for cracking down on North Korean defector groups, because this is a violation of human rights. I'll, I'll leave it at that. If anybody wants to jump in, think until it hurts. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think, uh, I think that it's so important to remember that one person's rights are another person's obligations, hmm. and so. You know, if if we're going to criticize the potentially totalitarian element of the Moon administration uh, because they're cracking down on what people should be allowed to do, it's like, well, sure, but at what cost, right? Because, like, are there are are there costs that perhaps the government is responsible for? being able to foresee that the individual actors perhaps cannot. And it's like, if these leaflets lead to a war, perhaps it's the government's job to prevent such a thing or, you know, whatever. And so like, are the individual human rights more important than the potential loss of hundreds of thousands or millions of people in their lives? It's, it's, it's a very delicate and mm-hmm. obviously complicated balancing mm-hmm. act that gets that gets put into low resolution language in order to in order to compress into a 130 word uh, mm-hmm. news article. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I'll just so... go ahead, Taylor. Oh, I was just going to say, I I mean, on the other side of that, I, I do think that when we conceptualize peace um that you know the suppression of free speech and the suppression of certain rights are kind of um incompatible with like a fully um peaceful society um like a society that has sort of entered that cosmopolitan like age and so i i think we have to be really careful um criticizing um uh you know human rights groups or trying to take away human rights um, in the attempt for peace, because I think we can kind of escalate conflict sometimes without realizing it at the same time. Yeah. And um, I'll add two things. And Michael, did you did you have something to say? 
Oh, no, I just interjected at the end, think till it hurts, like when we were going through all of the uh, <laughs> recent developments and stuff that read the um, the first-person documents, like really educate yourself on this. And, like mm-hmm. do not – seeing it through certain news lens or certain nationalistic or patriotic lenses can easily distort a lot of things as we've come to know throughout mm-hmm. this. And really – and it's a lot of work. It's hard stuff. It takes mm-hmm. a lot of – uh, time, effort, and energy to really do the work and to educate yourself. And it's painful, but I think in the end, you come out way stronger than you would be if you had not undergone that process to begin with. Yes. And what else are you going to do with your time? <laughs> As I always say, like, or what? Like, exactly. Uh, but um, on this point about free speech, peace, um, one like one thing is like the the type of activity was le- like sending leaflets over leaflets and loudspeakers like that has this his it has like this history it's steeped in the Korean War right like that kind of speech if you will it's not like the normal kind of free speech that we talk about so the very vehicle that that's being used. Um, like, uh, you know, it, it has, I would say like it's maybe triggering or, right, it, it's, con- it's conceptually connected to the very intense propaganda campaign that, and we, and that campaign continued um, after the Korean War by the UN. Um, <clears throat> so number one. Number two, um, I've mentioned this before, and it's really helped me think through this very difficult and complex morass of like human rights, peace, justice, dignity. Um, Humiliation is something that has been recently introduced in the study of international relations. I've mentioned the work of Evelyn Lidner. It's, It's really good. It's very interdisciplinary stuff, but like understanding that this is a, and like knowing how to, work with a humiliated people, um, uh, I think helps us to navigate through like some of the difficult parts of human rights versus peace um, and, you know, dignity. So I'll, uh, that's what I have to say with that. I also, like as we're coming to the end, um, I thought that we should end given that I think where we're going to go with the next show um, with the nuclear issue Um, because as Randy said uh, this is like one of the results um, of the failure to end the Korean War of the Korean War um, the nuclear issue and I I think was it Christine who said this is, is how you know most Americans when they think of Korea or North Korea, they think of it as a nuclear threat, and that's the frame through which yeah. they understand it. Yeah. And, um, you know, in a couple of weeks, we'll be commemorating the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and I think that we should talk about that, because this is also something that is, like, we're the only country to use these weapons. Um and this is really not a part of our education, is it? I mean, did you guys have a robust education on nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons jurisprudence? No. Not not Zero. not not in a, not in early air education, but in law school a little bit. Right, law school. <laughs> Me too. Class called international law and weapons of mass destruction in that class like had a huge impact on me. Um, but, and Michael, what about you? No, Nuclear. I, same thing, same for me here. No serious education when it came to the immense impact that these as, absolutely astronomically destructive weapons can have in all sorts of contexts. So yeah, yeah maybe law school, then I'll also have that experience too. <laughs> And um, this is not something just for lawyers uh, or law students, in my view. But in any case, that's uh, where we are. Um, and the goal is to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula and um, 
And uh, if you're interested, you can educate yourself on the disagreements and the negotiating um, positions of the U.S. vis-a-vis the DPRK on that, because it relates to the Korean War and, like, what comes first. Anyway, um, I'm going to end my comments there, and I'll just we'll just go around, um, starting with Taylor, then Michael, then Randy, final thoughts before we close out and exit the forest uh, of the Korean War. So, Taylor, any, any final thoughts? I think it's um, been an enlightening conversation, I guess extended conversation over seven weeks. And uh, to really dive into, like, this information about the Korean War that has kind of been um, ignored throughout history has been interesting, but also seeing it as sort of a conduit of so many different um, elements of um, the peace movement and um, the problems of armed conflict um, and how we as, like, peace activists can um, use this history and learn from it uh, to prevent future conflicts. Mm-hmm. Incredibly interesting. Cool. Michael? I second Taylor. I definitely feel I've learned a lot about the Korean War. It's always been, I'm a big, history is definitely a big side hobby of mine, and I've come to understand a lot more than I had through just generic uh, army statistics and all this stuff and really diving into the human element has been very inspiring mm. and very motivating and I really appreciated coming to know that. I also feel that as an individual who has not been so well versed in this and has just only begun my education of uh, the peace movement and stuff, I've definitely felt my frame of thinking shift over the course of these past seven episodes into sort of seeing through this peace lens and I definitely Mm -hmm. feel myself thinking more into wanting to be a part of it and coming to truly understand why it is valuable, why peace is more, is actually more strong than violence and war and all this. And I really am looking forward to all that I will continue to learn as I go on. No, I've ex- extremely appreciated these past seven shows for sure. Cool. And I just want to make another connection with, with Bertha von Sutner uh, to your comment. And that is just like, P.S. This is not a part of any class. Okay, <laughs> we are like we are coming together, quote, informally to have these discussions. And Bertha said, you know, um, the bulk of like the bulk of education occurs outside of the classroom and it happens in adulthood. It's lifelong and continuous. And the biggest educators are life and experience. And to her own example that I've mentioned, she's 45 years old when she learns about the peace movement totally changes her trajectory and the world, as Randy indicated, notwithstanding the Hague Peace Conferences. <laughs> but, um, okay, so I just wanted to make that, that connection, um, that, that the importance of, like, like, informal education in the education of the person, um, the full development of the human personality, as Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights puts it, um, that doesn't just happen in, in a formal setting. Uh, am I next? That was my point. <laughs> um, I'll, and Randy, I'll last point. No, that, that, oh, that right. was it. <laughs> I see. Well, I'll, I'll end on a personal anecdote, which is perfectly in line with what you just said. Um, you know, two years after I left the university, I started curious. Uh, you know, curiously investigating nuclear physics because it's just something I felt like doing. And one of the things I learned in that <laughs> bizarre phase of my life was that an, a, a hydrogen bomb uses a nuclear bomb as a trigger. And, and it's considerably more destructive. I mean, if we imagine that the bombs used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki are just the thing that gets the bombs started, the stuff we have now, then, you know, it, it, it illustrates the severity of devastation that people severely feared throughout the Cold War. And they were, in some sense, pretty justified in that fear. And somehow, you know, that has carried over into our fears about North Korea becoming nuclear 
uh, becoming a nuclear state. And so, of course, there's a justification based on fear for the narrative as it is. But, you know, the Korean War being the epicenter of the barbarization of the sky, as far as I can tell, like we have lots of horrible things happening in the Second World War and before that. But in, in the Korean War, the United States starts experimenting with napalm and we're in another territory once that starts where we're using unbelievably destructive things at a level that's it's a it's a totally new paradigm of destruction and that grows into hydrogen bombs and it grows into stealth bombers with hydrogen bombs attached to them and then it grows and it grows and at some point we have to say enough is enough mm-hmm. and that's exactly what Bertha von Sutner wrote like pretty much for verbatim minus the you know nuclear weapon bit but and she does say enough is enough and you stop at the sky like don't like that's the place to stop um and of course we did not heed her warning um so i don't want to end on a a doom and gloom note so let me just i'm not going to read the whole thing but i just want to refer to something that i've i've put on the show resources page we've been talking about like do your research and so forth it's just one it's a one page thing and it's from a book called where there is no path and this is a book about the development of the first woman to become a lawyer in korea and um she takes the the bar exam in 1950 before the Korean War um, and fails it. The Korean War begins and she ends up studying during the Korean War in 1953 and ends up passing it and really uh, impacts Korean society um, uh, as a peace activist, lawyer, amazing person. So I've just put this one pager on the show resource page. Her name is E. Tae Young and it's a story of positive history and an individual that we have stressed is very important. So um, there are others and it's up to you to find them. So you have been listening to Virtues of Peace. We hope to be back in a couple of weeks and um, now's the time to say goodbye, everyone. If you want to say goodbye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.